It's, it sounds like Jackson was doing electrochemistry on my face after I've been eating breakfast and I used salt water to wash my face. <laughs> Alex, you look like a schlump dink Would you go wash your face? You got interfaces of schmutz all over, and it's going to make the circuit fitting of your pores just awful. Welcome to the Electrochemistry Podcast, where we discuss all things electrochemistry. I'm your host, Dr. Alex Peroff, and with me is my co-host, Dr. Neil Spinner. On today's podcast, we are going to hear about Jackson, who is a postdoc researching new materials for electrochemical sensors. Now, part of the characterization process for this research involves performing electrochemical impedance spectroscopy on the sensors, in addition to DC techniques like chronoweight barometry and cyclic voltammetry. Jackson was feeling confident, having done a decent amount of electrochemistry and even some EIS during his time as a graduate student. And being an elder statesman in the lab as the postdoc, he did not anticipate running into any trouble that would delay his next publication. When he started running some tests on his newly fabricated sensors, his DC data looked fine. And at first glance, even his EIS data looked fine too. So he proceeded to run some circuit fitting analysis on the EIS data using some circuit analogs he saw published in papers studying similar types of electrochemical sensors. However, his circuit fitting just did not seem to work no matter what he did. No matter how much he played with the software, he only ever got one part of the data to fit okay, but the rest did not fit so well he wondered why his EIS data analysis just did not seem to be working. You know, Alex, I'm uh, sensing that, uh, you know, there might be a problem here. <laughs> I get it, because <laughs> he's testing sensors. I'm so funny, I can't even stand it. Is, is the first thing that comes to mind a bad dad joke? I think it is. Is that going to be a problem? Because, to be honest, I think you knew what you were getting into, you know, when you decided, hey, I want to do a podcast with this guy. And, you know, by that guy, I mean me. I did know what I was getting into, but... It's only when you experience it that you really know the depth of bad dad jokes. But it, it's all good. It's all good. I do appreciate a good and bad dad joke. Yeah, well, correction. There are no bad dad jokes. All dad jokes are, by <laughs> definition, solid gold. <laughs> so, speaking of gold, I know gold is sometimes used in biosensor research. Is Jackson using a gold electrode for this work? What kind of experimental system are we working with here? Good grief. Who's dad joking now? Actually, I take it back. I'm just so proud of you. Welcome to the club. We're happy to have you here. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Alex, and I'm addicted to dad jokes. Hi, Alex. You're safe here, friend. We want you to know that you can be your lame self here. Wait, sorry. Did, did I say lame? I meant spectacularly cool. You know, but anyway, so the system Jackson <laughs> is using is not gold, but it is a uh, screen printed electrode with a carbon working trace. And then he coated about 62 billion layers of junk on top of it to functionalize <laughs> it as a biosensor, all numbers approximate, for every single known and unknown disease in the entire animal and plant kingdom. But, okay, well, maybe not all of those things, but I mean, I've got the gist of how biosensors work, haven't I? Yeah, a, a biosensor, at least to my knowledge, uses a carbon screen printed electrode as the backbone. And then the researcher adds layers of biologically relevant stuff that makes it electroactive and selective for the analyte of interest. Right. So in Jackson's case, being you know a postdoc as he is, he's probably got plenty of experimental and electrochemistry and laboratory experience. So he knows what he's doing, you know, for the most part in terms of making the sensor and setting up the electrochemical tests. <clears throat> now, it's certainly always possible that there's I don't know, a reference electrode issue or a counter electrode issue, electrolyte issue. You know, okay, so we've, we've discussed these kinds of issues many times before, especially on this podcast. In this case, my hunch is that those factors may not be at play here, and it's likely something else. Yeah, in, in this specific case, Jackson is having a hard time doing EIS circuit fitting. This is assuming that all the experimental data is fine, and there are really no issues there. I believe the DC voltammetry results were also good. As far as we can tell, yes, the DC results are mostly fine. Okay, so we don't need to think about the DC data. It's just EIS, and more specifically, his issues doing circuit fitting, which, to be fair, is a whole different beast than actually doing and setting up an electrochemistry experiment. Circuit fitting is mostly just sitting in front of a computer and trying to get dots and lines to match up. 
for those who may hear what Alex just said and be very confused, what he means by dots are the <coughs> experimental EIS results, and uh, what I assume you mean by lines are the simulated circuit fit data. Exactly, and I feel Jackson's pain because I can never get the experimental and simulated EIS data to match, which means those dots and lines never really pair up. Yeah, but okay, but, but what if the dots don't want to pair up with the lines? You know, what if the dots just want to be left alone? Or maybe they want the company of other dots and the lines aren't that interesting to them. Why don't you care about the dots' feelings? Well, some dots are alone and not near any dots, and some dots and lines get along super well. You might even say they're a good fit. <laughs> but dum tish <laughs> Oh, I get it, because circuit fitting and all, yeah. yeah. I guess you could say that uh, they, they aren't in good alignment. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you know, in retrospect, admitting you to our dad joke anonymous meeting earlier might have been a bad idea. I think you and I have inadvertently created a monster that just simply cannot be stopped. Oh, yeah, I heard, I heard this one earlier today. Why did the teddy bear stop eating? Because it was stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so now, assuming that absolutely every one of our listeners has rage quit this podcast, and only our parents are listening out of sympathy, my hunch <laughs> is that Jackson is just a severe amateur at clicking buttons to make lines and dots coalesce. Okay, so what do you think he needs to do to fix you know, his circuit-fitting deficiencies? He spent too much time growing up learning chemistry and not enough time playing video games. Whenever I see people circuit-fitting, it's all a bunch of Rapid clicking and strategy, all those StarCraft pro gamers better watch out because EIS circuit fitting requires 300 actions per minute. Uh, I wonder if anyone who's listening, <laughs> which is basically our parents, uh, will get that. Yeah, this makes me think that there must be some publication out there with the title like, you know, quote, on the correlation between pro gamer status and EIS circuit fitting prowess, a cohort study. Nature, nature <laughs> paper. Yeah, there it is. Or, or how about like Blizzard Activision's next esports competition? Right. Forget everything you know about Diablo, Starcraft, Hearthstone, Call of Duty, Warcraft, Peacecraft, Regular Craft, Badcraft, Witchcraft, and every other craft. This is the World Championship of Circuit Fitting. Watch as electrochemists from around the world click and mash their way to the perfect semicircular solutions. Place your bets now. The Octodome is already sold out. Oh, man. So Jackson is going to be knocked out in the round of 32, <laughs> you know, unless he gets some advice real quick. And I think the first thing to recognize is that his crazy sensor system, I talked about those layers, right? So it likely means that there are a ton of complicated interactions that should affect the kind of circuit analog he chooses, you know, to try for his fitting. Right, so the first thing with any EIS circuit fitting is determining the appropriate equivalent electrical circuit, or EEC, for those in the business. And that usually requires thinking about your electrochemical system and attributing physical interfaces to electrical circuits. Precisely. So with this sensor, as I noted earlier, though it's well probably slightly fewer than 62 billion if we're being accurate there are definitely at least a couple of layers of interfaces going on you've got you know the carbon on the screen printed electrode itself and then let's just say there's i don't know some layer of junk on the carbon so we have carbon junk interface number one great okay next there's some schmutz on top of the junk so that makes junk schmutz interface number two and then let's just say that, you know, all we have and then we have electrolyte. So we have schmutz electrolyte interface number three. There might be, you know, more layers of schmutz somewhere like on the side, on his nose, on his forehead. But, you know, maybe we have at least those three interfaces going on. It's, it sounds like Jackson was doing electrochemistry on my face after I've been eating breakfast and I used salt water to wash my face. <laughs> Alex, you look like a schlumpadink. Would you go wash your face? You got interfaces of schmutz all over and it's going to make the circuit fitting of your pores just awful. That's, that's some next level grandma talk about <laughs> schmutz interfaces. So if we were modeling my face after having a pastrami sandwich on rye, <laughs> most of the schmutz consists of mustard. So you have the mustard to cheek interface, which would be modeled as a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. But I'm not that much of a schlumpadick. So there's still space on my cheek with no mustard. And, and that's also an interface. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so just like your disgusting, unwashed <laughs> punam of a face, Jackson's center, sensor has the carbon junk, junk schmutz, and schmutz electrolyte interfaces. But just like the bits of uh, exposed cheek on your face, there might be even some carbon schmutz or junk electrolyte. So like every possible 
combination carbon electrolyte <laughs> going on here, right? So some of the layers might be porous, some not, some fully covered, some not. And this is possibly like a really complicated structure. I mean, honestly, it's it's really no wonder Jackson is just a total circuit fitting noob. Yeah, he's not even like rank grandmaster circuit fitting. There are a lot of different interfaces that need to be modeled when doing EIS. And, and honestly, the worst part about this is that there's, there's no way around it. it this is a manual process it just is like no software or magic circuit fitting fairy can give you the like 100 percent perfect eec as they say in the biz so it's on jackson to pick the right circuit really this might be exactly the root of his problem if you think about it like either his you know noob skills are making the fit really bad or he just picked the wrong circuit or you know i don't know maybe a little column a a little column b but even if Jackson does pick the correct or optimal EEC, as they say in the biz, there is still the task of fitting the model to the data. And there are a lot of little <laughs> details in specific. Exactly. For, for example, what's the mathematical model that's used to perform the fit? Or for that matter, what even is fitting in the first place? These are great questions. And I'd like to, to welcome you to this next portion of our podcast where we discuss all things mathematics. It's like, uh, it's like the electrochemistry podcast, you know, where we discuss all things electrochemistry, but like way worse. I'm glad that you've all <laughs> stuck with us this far. And uh, well, by you all, I still just mean our parents. So circuit fitting is at its core a minimization algorithm. So whether those dots and lines like it or not, they're going to get close and they're going to snuggle together. Okay, <laughs> That's what the algorithm is trying to do. Now, granted, as we said before, if the model is all wrong for what the data is actually showing, the lines and dots, they're just they're never going to get comfy together. Okay, But if it is, let's say the model is right, the goal of the software is basically to move all of the circuit element parameters around so that the lines match up with the dots as closely as possible. So when I'm using circuit fitting, I get all these different mathematical options for trying to solve that minimization algorithm. I see options like simplex, Powell, levenberg markhardt parametric, complex, Schwarzenegger, skavitsky gole parachute, Frumkin-Ivanov, general electric, and polynomial. Yeah, okay, I think... I think you made some of those up, or, or maybe all of them, but especially Sch Schwarzenegger? I mean, what would a Schwarzenegger fitting algorithm be like? Get get to the minimum! <laughs> Rod, go! What you doing? I'll be back with more results from your circuit fit. The capacitance is too high! Drop the capacitance! The high frequency is mostly artifact. You have to ignore it! <laughs> the only weighting setting I prefer is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> hey, hey, Alex, I have a question. Do you think that people have had enough of awful Arnold impressions? I mean, we could do another 25 minutes of Arnold does EIS if that seems like a good idea. <laughs> I mean, in principle... Jackson shouldn't care if it's us or Arnold helping him with his EIS circuit fitting. You know, I bet he would prefer Arnold Schwarzenegger to us. It's like a super intense and nerdy motivational speaker in your laboratory. Hmm. So, so what if we did the rest of the podcast in the Arnold voice? Or would it be, would it be too annoying? I, I think it got annoying yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we sprinkle a little Arnold here and there to spice up the circuit fitting, as they say in the biz. Well, as they say in the biz, I think we can say... Hasta la vista, baby, uh, to Arnold for at least a little while. So, so everybody, you know, before everybody gets so annoyed that, well, they reach through their earbuds and start to strangle us. So uh, back to your real and uh, definitely not real list of EIS circuit fitting algorithm methods, uh, some of which may or may not be available, depending on, of course, which software you're using or which whatever program you're doing your circuit fit with. Mainly, they all work by adjusting the lines. If you think back to our dots and lines discussion, pre-Arnold discussion. And whether it's got resistors, capacitors, CPEs, inductors, Warburgs, transistors, imposters, or gangsters, that line <laughs> represents the simulation of your chosen circuit analog, which is this complex mess of terms and variables. Some of those variables are things that you're interested in and you want to solve for, like the capacitance and the resistance. And the, the closer... All the dots are to the line means you're getting the best estimate of those values for your real system. You have just succinctly defined circuit fitting, my friend. Wha bam! <laughs> and the closeness of the dots and lines is described by a statistical parameter called chi squared, which is by far my least favorite statistical parameter ever. Hmm. Seriously, 
I hate this thing. Do you, do you know how many times during <laughs> webinars, customer visits, phone calls, live streams, whatever, I get asked about this stupid thing? What does it mean? What's it supposed to be? Is this a good chi-squared value? You know what? I don't know and nobody knows. Okay, <laughs> There are no standards for this statistic. Every company in software calculates it like ever so slightly differently. And I absolutely hate having to explain it. Is one okay? How about 0.1? Maybe one times 10 to the minus 15? No, it's not low enough. Wait, no, 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 that's perfect. I, I seriously, I wish chi-square would just go away and stop haunting. But in general, for those who don't know, you want chi-square to be small. Yeah, but how small? See, now it's gonna haunt you too. <laughs> Small enough that Peter, Michael Bolton, and Samir would be able to get away with stealing chi-squared amounts of money from Inatech during their money laundering scheme. Wait, did you just reference 1999 cult classic workplace comedy film Office Space starring Ron Livingston and Jennifer Aniston directed by Mike Judge? I certainly did, man. What a great movie. Every time I go to weddings or family events and I meet someone who has like this super crazy job title, I'm always like, so what would you say you do here? I, I have people scales. What the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> Every time we're on the phone or doing the live stream, that's our response. Yeah. The, the next trade show I go to for Pine, I'm going to act this way. Someone comes up to the booth, like wanting to ask, you know, what we have that's new or whatever. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I don't I don't make new products. My boss makes those decisions. Don't tell me I don't do anything. I have traveling and people skills. I have booth skills. Although, although truthfully, we do protect our engineers and boss from talking to people who call us. Yeah, actually, this is 100% true. And if you meet our boss, please don't tell him we admitted this, but he's not the person we want answering the phones and emails. Although, contrary to popular belief, and by popular, I just mean the Pine Research sales team, if a customer does talk to our boss about a problem, it will absolutely get fixed. Even if it's some janky one-off product or software update, He'll fix it for you. Yeah, this is absolutely true. He's been known to talk to a customer who wants to do like, you know, some crazy harebrained kind of experiment. And then he goes away for several hours or days, codes the experiment into our software and delivers it to the customer. Maybe he's just like nicer than us. <laughs> Honestly, like that much personalization is just way too much effort because, you know, like I said, I have PayPal skills. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll even name the technique after you. We'll, we'll have like Mindy's step... Potential dynamic ranging gyroscopic floating potential stat technique voltammetry. <laughs> hey, in our boss's defense, it's extremely popular with uh, uh, Mindy's all over the research landscape. We all need our boss to program Jackson's EIS polynomial fitting algorithm voltammetry. Oh, yeah, well, I was with you until the voltammetry part, <laughs> but definitely the fitting. Uh, maybe we can enlist him to do that for us. But your point about the polynomial is actually interesting. So before you mentioned in your perfectly concise explanation of circuit fitting, how changing the values of those you know, resistors, capacitors, et cetera, gets the lines close to the dots. Well, you could ask the question, what if we just put in like a million resistors and a million capacitors? You know, In theory, wouldn't that give us just like all the levers to adjust so that the fit is always ideal? Knowing our boss, yeah, he would certainly do that. But he might push back on just making things look good for the customer. We do have to make sure that the data is fitting and it's legit. It's not just made up. All the resistors and capacitors that we use to fit need to represent something in real life. Otherwise, you could just use an nth order polynomial and it would be a great fit, but the values it gives you wouldn't really have any meaning. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, so we've settled that, you know, Jackson has this tough to fit EIS data and you know, perhaps he could fit like a, I don't know, billionth order polynomial and get dots and lines all cozied up, but it wouldn't mean anything in reality, which, well, it doesn't help him when he's writing his, you know, discussion section of the next publication, right? So what that means is he still has to find the right circuit model, likely with limited elements. He can't build an infinite circuit model that perfectly fits because he's got to use the schmutz cheek electrolyte system to build a representative model. But once he's got the model, he's got to use some special fitting algorithm to fit the data. Exactly, which, you know, like you mentioned a little while ago, those algorithms are things like Simplex, Levenberg, Markhart, Schwarzenegger, Parachute, General Electric, Kramer's Kronig, you know, whatever's basically available in the software that Jackson's using. Right. What, uh, what, was, what was that last one you mentioned? What's, what's Kramer's Kronig? Uh, oh, I, I didn't mention that earlier. Oh, I, I guess I did. Well, okay, so it's, it's like this different... I don't know, special type of circuit fit, but its only purpose is to help you identify if the data is like even valid 
EIS data in the first place. Valid EIS. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, so very briefly, there are three criteria that must be exhibited if the data can be even properly considered impedance at all. And those conditions are called linearity, causality, and stability. So without going too far down the biographies of both Kramers and Kronig, uh, these two, I guess, 20th century physicists helped contribute to these mathematical relations. You can apply to any EIS data to answer that question of validity. Right. And so, and I, I mean, if you think about it, you know, if the EIS data isn't valid in the first place, well, probably Jackson shouldn't bother doing any circuit fitting at all. I mean, you should be thinking about redoing his tests altogether. Once again, things that could have been put to my attention yesterday. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, great movie line <laughs> reference from The Wedding Singer, I think. But secondly, yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. So wait, let's, uh, let's take a look at Jackson's uh, Kramer's Kronig data here. Shows. Oh, wait. Yeah, well, I, okay, so I guess it kind of shows his data isn't valid. Hmm, well, then. So so that means that, like, no matter how hard Jackson tries or whatever our <laughs> boss programs for him, <laughs> it's not going to work. Like, Kramer's Kronig deems that, like, j just from the start, whether the circuit fitting would even work in the first place. It would seem that way, yes, uh, and particularly for Jackson here. I mean, essentially as a... As a rule of thumb, if Kramer's Kronig does not look good, absolutely no circuit fit will look good. So you should just give up and try something else, like going outside, for example. <laughs> well, it looks like Jackson needs to, unfortunately, go back to the lab to get some valid EIS data. And speaking of going outside, here's a word from our sponsors. Are you struggling with doing electrochemistry research in the lab? Do normal CVs that used to be easy now seem impossible or just don't work? These symptoms might indicate you are suffering from electrochemical performance dysfunction, or EPD. I used to publish in Nature and Jacks all the time. Now I can't even get ruthenium hexamine to look like a normal duck. If you're having these kinds of issues in the laboratory, you may be a good candidate for our experimental new treatment, going outside. In clinical studies, patients who used going outside instead of doing electrochemistry research experienced 87% higher levels of happiness, fulfillment, and pure unadulterated joy. <laughs> After going outside, I have a new lease on life and some new ideas why my experiments don't work. Side effects of going outside may include observing natural light, interacting with everyday human beings, small talk, and lower blood pressure. Contact your research advisor if you experience bad results for more than four hours. Come see what 11 electrochemists have already discovered by taking that first step away from your research lab and going outside. Advertisement is a joke for comedy purposes and is not real, nor does it constitute an offer of any kind from Pine Research. Restrictions apply. See terms and conditions for details. Not valid in Alaska, Hawaii, any of the contiguous 48 states, or any country on any of the seven earthly continents, except Antarctica. Contact Pine Research for details, real offers, life advice, or product quotes. Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to play a game of Two Truths and a Lie, Electrochemistry Trivia. So for those who are unfamiliar with the game, I'm going to say three sentences or statements. Two of them will be true, and one of them will be made up. The goal is for my colleague, Neil, to spot the incorrect statement. Now, the context of these statements is within the realm of electrochemistry history. <laughs> and I'll tell you, there is some absolutely fascinating electrochemistry history out there. So I prepared three statements, two are true and one is false, and we will be asking my esteemed colleague Neil if he can spot the lie. Neil, are you ready? Boy, am I. I love me some electrochemistry history. <laughs> That's right, because electrochemistry history, quite frankly, is kind of crazy, just like regular history. All right, so let's begin. But first, a quick introduction. We are heading back to June of 1945, just before World War II officially ended. There was a scientific conference held in Moscow for the 220th anniversary of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR. At this time, there were 14 American scientists who made their way to the conference and the celebration, meeting with prominent Russian electrochemists, most notably Alexander Frumkin, who was the leading electrochemist at Moscow State University and the director of the Institute for Electrochemistry at the Academy of Sciences of the USSR. The Americans stayed for about two weeks before heading back to the United States. Little did they know, about 10 days later, the United States would successfully test their first nuclear weapon in the New Mexico desert. This would lead to heavy scientific restrictions between America and Russian scientists. 
For many years, Alexander Frumkin would work with other Russian scientists making huge advances in the field of electrochemistry, while most American scientists wouldn't have a clue about Alexander's accomplishments. So with this in mind, and testing our limited knowledge of Russian electrochemistry, which of the following was not a Russian chemist who worked with Alexander Frumkin? I'm going to say Bill Nye the science guy. No, no, wait, no, wait. Albert Einstein. Well, I... I mean, I, okay, I, I guess that, that's technically true, but I haven't told you the names of the scientists that I have in mind. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that I'm already a winner at this game before we even start, even when I inevitably get, like, the real game wrong. So I just, I still consider myself a winner, FYI. <laughs> that's right, Neil. You were born a winner. And once a winner, always a winner. I'm sure that's a, that's a saying, you know, somewhere. Yeah, I think Michael Jordan said that as he was winning his 97th <clears throat> NBA championship. And he was definitely saying it about me, just so you know. There's a little sports ball history for you. <laughs> Always managed to get some sports ball history into electrochemistry history. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, so which of the following was not a Russian chemist who worked with Alexander Frumkin? Isaac Koltov. That's one. <laughs> Lev Nikolaevich Nikolaevich Nekrasov, that's two. Boy, are you sure? These are some hard names. These are, these are some hard <laughs> names. As, as Americans, these are some hard names. Yeah, Russian's <laughs> a tricky language for sure. And then the last one is Benjamin Levich. So, so not Albert Einstein, huh? Okay, well, I suppose before I start making wild and probably illogical guesses, you need to like start telling me some details about each of these people because I don't think I've ever heard of any of these people despite apparently being a PhD-trained electrochemist. So please don't tell my boss how dumb I am. Actually, don't worry, because I'm pretty sure the vast majority of chemists and electrochemists are not familiar with these Russian electrochemists or are familiar with this, just this period of history. Let's start with Isaac Koltov. Isaac Koltov, a famous analytical chemist who worked with Frumkin on relating the measured current to the concentration of electroactive analytes. This was paving the way into the field of electrochemical sensors. Koltov later became a professor of chemistry at the uni at Moscow State University of Fine Chemical in Technologies, continuing to collaborate with Frumkin, publishing over 150 peer-reviewed publications and 27 patents. Okay, first of all, I assume that the presence of a Moscow State University of Fine Chemical Technologies suggests that there might also be a St. Petersburg State University of Coarse Chemical Technologies. <laughs> uh, uh, Oh, I always find those kinds of jokes hilarious. Just, just name an, another related-sounding thing for the slightly opposite-sounding application. Exactly. This is, this is why I definitely just – I already don't like this Koltov guy. I'm a simple man, okay? I prefer my coffee hot and my chemical technologies coarse. I don't trust anyone who is so fancy they have to be into fine chemical technologies. <laughs> Blame the person, not the – Random name of the institution. Hey, listen, I blame whoever I want. <laughs> All right. All right. So next on the list is <laughs> – let me take a oh, This is the this name, one. huh? <laughs> Lev Nikolaevich Nekrasov, who was a student and eventually became a professor at Monka Moscow State University in the chemistry department. Nekrasov is most famous for developing the instrumentation for the rotating ring disk electrode, and along with Frumkin, was able to detect short-lived electroactive intermediates. Nekrasov was later awarded the Inventor's Certificate for his development of yet another electrochemical technique, hydroelectrochemical impedance. Wait, in Inventor's Certificate? <laughs> So has there ever been a lazier name for an award? Hey, hey, like, congratulations, George Clooney, for your role as an actor in this movie. We're giving you the Movie Actors Award. So prestigious. Well, I guess it's very easy to know what the award's about. I mean, I always get, like, the Oscars and the Grammys confused. It'd be much easier if they just had, like, the name of the award was what it was about. Like, the ACS Young Investigator Award. Let me guess. It's an award for young investigators. Nope, that's incorrect. It's an award that's exclusively given to old people who are perfectly content with the way things are and don't wish to look into anything further. Get it? Get, get it? Because that's, that's the opposite of both young and investigating. <laughs> Just like the fine and coarse chemical institutes. Exactly. <laughs> Although, actually, though, I will say that none of you say this. I think I might actually agree with the naming of these awards. It's, it's silly because, honestly, I – 
I actually can also never remember which of those like dumb award ceremonies are for music or acting or dancing or theater, or selling stuff on the side of the road or doing sock puppets with children or whatever. You forgot the award for best mime. <laughs> I would tell you all about the World Mime Association, but I hear they're pretty silent on the details. But um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so on to the last Russian chemist, Benjamin Levich who was a younger colleague of Frumkin at the Moscow State uh, University. Benjamin Levich and Frumkin were both electrochemists studying hydrodynamic electrochemistry. Benjamin Levich is most famous for his book on physio-electrochemical hydrodynamics and the Levich equation, which is named after him, and it, that describes the current that's found at a rotating disk electrode. While Levitch worked for many years in Russia with Frumkin, he eventually left Russia and became the Albert Einstein Professor of Science at the City College of New York, or CUNY, back in 1979. And today, the Levitch Institute for Physiochemical Hydrodynamics is at CUNY. So, all right, Neil. So, which one of these chemists isn't Russian and didn't work for Frumkin? Wait, wait, wait. Did, did you say that he became Albert Einstein? Like... <laughs> I thought I already told you Albert Einstein was my answer. I had no idea that this guy also became Albert Einstein. That's that's quite the resume, too, if you think about it. Like, like what, Levitch here, right? He study electrochemistry, develop stuff on the RDE, get an equation and a method named after yourself, move to the United States, become Albert Einstein, and then retire. Life well lived. <laughs> I suppose those naming conventions for established scientists can get a little confusing, especially when you're a professor – of another professor, so you're like a double professor now. <laughs> this is like professorception. He's like a professor by day, Albert Einstein by evening, and and then in his dreams, he's like another professor. It's like a triple infinity professor. I wonder if Albert Einstein was like the the something something professor when he was at Princeton. So yes, there might be a way to become like a triple to infinity professor. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Like <laughs> Levitch was a professor. He was also Albert Einstein. And then he was also every professor Albert Einstein ever professored. <laughs> this makes perfect sense. <laughs> Man, this means professors today are like so, so, so many professors, like all in one. Oh, please don't tell them that though. The last thing we need is a bunch of professors with even bigger egos. <laughs> <laughs> sigh. Oh, uh, sigh. Very true. <laughs> Just kidding. We love, yeah, we're, we love we're all of you in We're kidding. We're kidding. <laughs> we're kidding. Yeah. Okay, Neil. Now that you've heard all the different Russian chemists, which one do you think I just made up? Isaac Koltov, Lev Nikolaevich Nekrasov, or Benjamin Levich? And you're getting finally good at saying these names. That's right. I say. It's, taken, it's taken a while, but <laughs> it's good. Well, okay. For, I have to come clean, first of all. Is that before I told you I hadn't heard of any of these, I, I lied. I have heard of Levich since... You know, I, I've only used his equation about 400 million times. And I've also heard of Nekrasov before. But what I can't tell you is that I know if any of them <clears> worked <throat> with Frumkin before. And because I haven't heard of Isaac Koltov, it makes me think he's the right answer. But maybe that's what you want me to think, isn't it? You're trying to throw me off the scent. It's like double super secret reverse psychology going on here. Like kind of like the double super secret infinity professor paradigm. The, the only reverse psychology I use is when we're trying to determine what pine shirts we're going to wear for the live stream. <laughs> Good grief. That's so true. I, this happens. Somehow we end up wearing the same color like pine polo shirt like 75% of the time, even though I swear in the entire time we've worked together, I don't think you and I have ever had a single conversation about what clothing we're going to wear like ever. It's, it's like, okay, okay I'm going to stick with the double super secret psychology thought anyway, though. T-shirts and professors aside, because I think you're playing mind tricks on me. I'm going to go with Levitch. Final answer. Are you sure you want to go with Levitch? No. But I also know that if I wear this green shirt, you're going to want to pick the red one. And then I'm going to just pick the red one because that's what you were going to do because you're trying to trick me. And then somehow we're both going to show up in gray. <laughs> Wait, sorry. We're, we're, we're talking about Russian electrochemists, not, not live stream. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> so actually, yes, I'm going to stick with Levitch. Final answer. Okay, so that is unfortunately incorrect. Ah. Levitch and Frumpkin both worked together. Maybe not as like direct partners, but they were both at the Moscow at Moscow State University working together on hydrodynamic electrochemistry. The correct answer, and the one that I just made up, is Isaac Koltov. <laughs> Isaac is actually a Dutch-born American who is a, a very famous analytical chemist. Some would argue 
he would be the father of analytical chemistry. But he wasn't technically an electrochemist. Well, that's disappointing. And he may be the father of analytical chemistry, but he's also the source of just my greatest disappointment now. I can't believe I fell for your psychological tricks again. At least we're wearing the same shirt, though. <laughs> well, well, remember how I mentioned that before the end of World War II, there were 14 Americans who visited Moscow. Isaac was one of them. And perhaps he met and spoke with Frumpkin, but they, they never formally collaborated. And again, Isaac isn't Russian. But anyway, that will do it for this game of Two Truths and a Lie. I hope you all learned something new about electrochemistry history, and we'll see you on the next episode of the podcast.